Sally Pipes is the president and CEO of the Pacific Research Institute, which is a think tank based in San Francisco, California. She is a, a widely recognized and very highly regarded uh, expert in healthcare policy. Uh, she's written uh, countless opinion articles that have run in numerous uh, newspapers and news magazines all over the country. Uh, she's uh, delivered many, many speeches, served on uh, many policy panels, uh, and authored multiple books on the subject. Uh, including the top 10 myths of American healthcare, which has been praised uh, by such prominent figures as Thomas Sowell. And uh, I know I speak for everybody at NPRI when I tell uh, Sally that we are uh, very uh, honored and uh, delighted <coughs> and grateful that you can join us uh, here today. So with that, please join me in welcoming Sally Pike. Thank you for that kind introduction, and it's a delight to be here on a beautiful day in Vegas, um, in San Francisco. I think it's been raining since last fall, and Sharon and I are both from Vancouver, and probably one of the reasons we don't live in Vancouver is we were fed up with rain, so thank you for putting on a lovely uh, day. Um, today is a very important day. It is the day of the um, Obama Healthcare Summit at the um, at Blair House across the street from the White House. So we can talk a bit more about that during the question and answer period. I did some radio shows this morning from um, Wisconsin, Denver, um, a few other places. And um, yesterday did a debate with someone from the Huffington Post um, on MSNBC who said that the Obama's 11-point plan was actually a conservative Republican plan. So you just never know when you debate people whether they're, you know, that they understand what they're talking about or not. But anyway, it's always, healthcare is a lot of fun. What I thought I would do is talk about the two visions for healthcare reform in America, and then I'm gonna talk a bit about myth number 10 in my book, that socialized systems such as exist in Canada are cheaper and more efficient. And then I'm going to talk about Obama's 11 uh, page uh, framework and end up with some solutions. And I promise I won't talk for more than 30 minutes because we won't have time for Q&A and I don't want people um, suffering from horizontal neurosis listening to me talk about healthcare. What I'd like to say is understanding healthcare is similar to unraveling an onion. There are many layers and many tearful moments. I think that everyone here would agree we all want affordable, accessible, quality healthcare. The question is how best to achieve that goal. There are two competing visions when it comes to healthcare reform and achieving universal coverage um, in America. One vision focuses on patient-centered solutions, empowering doctors and patients, and encouraging innovation in new drugs, uh, biologics, and medical devices. The other vision focuses on increasing the role of government in our healthcare system through increased taxes, mandates, subsidies, and as of Monday, controls on insurance companies. This latter vision is the vision that is on the rise. It's the vision of President Obama, and it was the vision of the late Senator Ted Kennedy when he talked in the 70s, and latterly in the last few years of his life about his vision for Medicare for all. Very few people understand that we don't have a free market or a competitive market or a market in healthcare. 50% of, health, of the healthcare industry today is in the hands of government. Now, it was 47% just before the new numbers for uh, 2009 came out. And that 50% is in Medicare, the program for um, elderly people, uh, Medicaid, the program for low-income Americans, the state children's health insurance plan, and the veterans administration plan. So how do we achieve universal coverage in healthcare at the same time that we uh, solve the problem of reducing costs? While denying it, President uh, Kennedy is on, President Obama is on the record of supporting single-payer healthcare, that is government being the only provider of healthcare. He said that in his speech um, a few years ago in 2003 at the annual meeting of the AFL-CIO, he has said it in meetings with the Service Employees International Union. I think it's important to know that there are only two single-payer healthcare systems that exist in the world. One is Canada and the other is North Korea. 
<laughs> Cuba used to have a single payer system, but even they've opened up to some private medicine. <laughs> Democratic Congressman Barney Frank, who is a major proponent of single payer and from the state of Massachusetts, of course, um, recently said, um, when interviewed by a TV uh, person, that he really supports single payer, but he felt that they don't have the votes in Congress. So that is why he was supporting the idea of the public option, a government-run insurance uh, plan, uh, because he thought that's the way we'll get the camel's nose under the tent and we could move ultimately to single payer. And Howard Dean, um, former governor of Vermont and former head of the DNC, he is very much in favor of this, this vision as well. So I thought I would take a look at, you know, um, the reality of universal coverage under a single-payer healthcare system such as exists in Canada. Affordability. Michael Moore in his movie Sicko talks about the wonderful healthcare systems of Canada, France, Great Britain, and even Cuba. They're all free, he said. But of course, for those people who come from a country like Canada know healthcare is not free. You pay for it through the tax system. <laughs> But, you know, when Silvio Berlusconi, the Prime Minister of Italy, needed to have some heart surgery, did he go to London, Paris, Toronto, or even Havana, Cuba? No, he came to the Cleveland Clinic here in America, where the very finest in healthcare is available. So I'd like to ask, how many people here have seen Michael Moore's movie, Sicko? More than usual, must have, been too hot. must have been the summer and it was too hot for people in, the, in Vegas to do, to do other things. But I always say, most times when I speak, even to very large audiences, you know, one or two people will put up their hand and I say, no wonder it wasn't a great success at the box office. Um, having a cameo appearance in that film, uh, Michael Moore took a clip of me with an interview with Bill O'Reilly where he asked me about the Canadian healthcare system and I gave the reasons I didn't like it. and. Um, and so um, he took that clip. He didn't give out the reasons that I had given why I don't, don't like it, but he used it as his introduction to those Canadians that he interviewed that do like the Canadian healthcare system. And I can assure you, they are people who've never had to really use the healthcare system for anything that is considered major. The US government in 2009 spent 17.3% of our gross domestic product on healthcare. It's about $2.5 billion and the healthcare sector accounts for about one-sixth of the United States economy. Uh, people say, and Obama says it all the time, that we are spending too much on healthcare. Now I realize 17.3% is a lot, but I'm not sure if it's too much, maybe it's too little. America is an aging population, and Americans demand the very best in healthcare. And they don't want to be told, no, you can't have this procedure, you can't have this test. Um, as my friend Ubi Reinhardt, who's a professor at Princeton, and who is a big proponent of single-payer health care, we debate a number of times, but he always agrees with me at the end that the American people would not tolerate the Canadian-style system because we're too impatient and we don't want to be told we can't have something. Canada, on the other hand, spends 9% of its gross domestic product on health care, and that's one of the goals that the President and Pelosi and Reid have been talking about. Well, Canada spends 9% of its GDP on health care because that's what the government has decided they're going to spend on health care. As a result, that's the, that's the budget that they can afford, and as a result, Canada has long waiting lists for care, rationed or denied care, and lack of access to the latest new technology and treatments. 